Hello there. So my voice is going to be a little low, but pretty close to the microphone, so hopefully you can hear me just fine in the recording here. And I'm going to pick up where we left off on Friday, talking about electromagnetic waves. And on Friday, we spent a fair amount of time kind of just generally talking about the connection between these electric circuits we've been talking about and the production reception of electromagnetic waves, and then a few basic properties of them, some of which I've, I've repeated here, right? So, for instance, in a vacuum, we know that all electromagnetic waves, so EM waves, propagate at C equals 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, right there, okay? And it, what's interesting is that if you were to derive this using Maxwell's equations and the wave equation, you would find from those that C is related to these fundamental constants, the permeability of free space. Remember that that is um, related to all sorts of magnetic effects. So, for example, we saw it in the equation we had for a, a solenoid, like a wire coil. And epsilon naught here, the second one, is the permittivity of free space, which was related to uh, electric fields, right? And how strong they were in a particular region, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And it's a little, little bit of an interesting coincidence that those two more or less fundamental constant, constants are related to this other fundamental constant of nature, which is the speed of light, or the speed of an electromagnetic wave in a vacuum. Now, in addition to that, at any instant, if you were to be able to measure the magnitude of the electric field of the wave, and at that same moment, measure the magnitude of the magnetic field, and you took the ratio of those things, that would be equal to this 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And that's that's weird. Like not not other most other waves, no other wave is is related to sort of fundamental constants of nature and to the amplitude of the wave in quite this way. And that makes electromagnetic waves quite special for for all kinds of reasons. So, <clears throat> we know okay, that the direction of the wave is in this direction. And the fact that it oscillates up and down in terms of, in this picture, like the electric field, and it oscillates left, right in terms of the magnetic field, and yet the velocity of the wave is perpendicular to both of those things, that uh, makes EM waves what's called uh, a transwerf, trans, transwerf. EM waves are transverse. Okay. Now there are other transverse waves out there. Okay. Uh, a wave on a string, right? If you were to sort of take one end of the string and wiggle it back and forth, and so you have this wave propagating down it, right? The wave on the string is propagating away from you, say, along the string, and the string itself is oscillating perpendicular to that uh, direction of, of propagation. Uh, but EM waves are another example of this. Whereas uh, in strings, you have just the string moving back and forth. Here you have both electric and magnetic fields oscillating. Notice that they are in phase. So let me point that out. Okay. In other words, their peaks and valleys happen at exactly the same time. And uh, so we have these two fields rather than an actual physical object uh, that we can hold in our hand, in the case of the string, uh, oscillating perpendicular to the direction of the velocity of the wave. Mm. I mentioned last time that uh, EM waves can propagate through nothing, okay? Electric fields and magnetic fields don't need a medium in which to exist. And so they can propagate through anything, okay? Sort of, okay? And perhaps I should amend that to say it can propagate without a medium. Without a medium. 
Whereas things like sound waves, well, you need a medium, like water or air or something like that, through which they propagate. Okay, all of these things uh, we mentioned last time, but the last two things that I sort of put on our docket for this time is the idea that one, EM waves, sometimes just referred to as light, even though normally we, we refer to it visible light, uh, that little tiny band in the electromagnetic spectrum we looked at last time as light, but electromagnetic waves, however you want to call, uh, refer to them, carry energy. And I can write. And it's usually expressed in terms of the intensity of the wave. And there's a few different equations that all give you the same result. It just sort of depends on what information you have. But the intensity of the wave is related to its velocity, so c. It's related to another one of these fundamental constants. It's related to the maximum electric field divided by 2, and related to a couple of other things as well. I believe that's it. And then there's a third form. Now, most of the things in here are just constants, mu0 and epsilon naught, and, or epsilon 0 and c, and that kind of thing. But you'll notice that um, the things that really stick out, right, the things that, that change per per wave are these things okay so e subscript zero here is referring to the maximum value of the electric field okay? and that can be different depending on what wave if you're using a lot of power to generate the wave a very powerful radio transmitter for instance then the amplitude of this is uh, very large and so the intensity of the wave is also very large right so these quantities are the things that depend on the wave that you're considering. Okay, that really is an E, despite my penmanship. Okay. And those um, are determinative of what the intensity of the wave is. Now, how do we measure intensity? Well, we measured it in units of watts per meter squared, so power over an area. And sometimes this is best thought of in terms of a, a simple s situation. So imagine that we have a point. You can imagine it as actually something quite large. You can think about the sun, but then think about this circle that I'm drawing around it as like, I don't know, the, the, the orbit of um, Mars or something like that. And so the sun looks relatively small in the middle of that, okay? But, but here's the idea, okay? If you're a distance r from this thing that is radiating out, these are like the maxima in the, uh, say, the electric field, so radiating out wave fronts in all directions, okay? And you're a, sitting at that dotted line, so a distance r from the origin uh, the thing that's creating these electromagnetic waves it could be the radio transmitter tower, whatever you want to think about it as, and uh, whatever the source of electromagnetic radiation you have there. And uh, if you're sitting there at the dotted border, you can work out that the intensity of the light at that point, okay, at that distance, I should say, because you could be sitting anywhere on that dotted circle, is the power of the source, so p sub s, divided by, by 4 pi r squared. Now, what's 4 pi r squared come from? Well, if you just have a point and it's radiating equally in all directions, and these wave fronts, I mean, they look like circles here, but the wave fronts are going to be spheres, right? They go off in every direction. And so 4 pi r squared is the surface area of a sphere. That's where that comes from. Okay. So, Two things. One, uh, the intensity obviously depends on the source. Um, if you have a more powerful source, like more wattage in your radio transmitter, then you're going to have uh, greater intensity at whatever distance from that 
source. But the big thing that is taken away from this equation a lot of times, and, and I think is the most important thing, is that uh, this factor right here, which tells us that the intensity of electromagnetic radiation, electromagnetic waves, some distance away from their emitter, is proportional to 1 over r squared. So if you double the distance between you and the emitter of an electromagnetic wave, then you are going to be cutting the intensity at your position by a factor of 4, right? It goes as the square of the distance. And that's a nice little little factoid that's, uh, that's useful to have. Now, it, it's not always the case that you have an irradiator of electromagnetic waves that like is a point, effectively a point anyway, and radiates equally well in all 360 degrees around it in terms of the circle and as a sphere, if you put it in sort of solid angles. Um, but uh, the, the intensity equation is given sufficient distance from a source generally follows the same one over r squared behavior. And so it's nice sort of a rule of thumb. <clears throat> we'll come back to electromagnetic waves and their energy when we start talking about light as a particle near the end of the, of the semester, because uh, in addition to its wave nature, as it turns out, electromagnetic um, radiation also has a, um, a particle nature, like little BBs, like electrons or something like that. And it's, uh, it's kind of cool to think about. Uh, it sort of bridges into the realm of quantum mechanics. But we'll get there. Now, another thing that I set up last time was this, which is that electromagnetic waves have momentum. I don't know that this is really talked about in much detail in your textbook, but it's a, it's a cool thing, and I think it is, bears mentioning. And the example I mentioned last time is that sometimes, um, you know, you might see a little toy sitting on a shelf somewhere. You might even own one. And I'm looking sort of down. So this is, this is the axis of rotation. So I'm looking down at the edge of a very thin piece of paper or plastic or metal foil. And on one side, like a big sail, and so we're looking at the edge of it, it's painted white. And on the other side, it's painted black. <clears throat> and uh, if you shine light on this thing, say we, uh, we have some source of electromagnetic radiation over here, if you shine light on this thing and you send in electromagnetic waves, as we know, I'm just drawing out sort of the electric field component here, but you can imagine trying to draw vaguely the same frequency. I'm not sure how, uh, how effective I was, but you can get the idea. So it's the same source, same frequency of, uh, of electromagnetic radiation, and um, you will get a rotation of this thing. The whole thing will start rotating so that this side starts going this way, and this side then rotates this way. Okay in response to just the light hitting it. No breaths of wind or anything like that. So what's going on there? Well, um, if electromagnetic waves have energy, it's not too much of a leap to suspect that they have momentum. But of course, the, the equation that we had for momentum in mechanics doesn't really apply here, right? Uh, light does not have mass, for instance. And it certainly does have a velocity, very large one, but with no mass, there's no sort of momentum by this standard. However, the effect of um, the, intense, the energy involved in the intensity of light is to give it a momentum, and the expressions that we can use to quantify this is that if you have a situation where you have perfect don't squish your letters there, Matt. Perfect absorption. Uh, 
then the change in energy of the object divided by the speed of light is equal to the change in momentum of the object. Okay, great. Still not seeing maybe how that applies here, but let, let's, let's go one step farther. The change in momentum, if you have something that is perfectly reflecting, okay, you have the same expression except for this all-important factor of two. Now think about that for a moment and go cast your mind back to mechanics and inelastic versus elastic collisions. If you have an elastic collision, right, and you have a ball that comes down and it hits and it turns completely around and it rebounds back off, you know from that that the transfer of momentum to the object that it hit is at a maximum. And if you have a perfectly inelastic collision, then the momentum transfer to the object, right? So perfectly inelastic is when they stick together, okay? It's kind of like absorption in this case. Then you have a minimum transfer of momentum, and thus a minimum change in energy of that thing. So that's the kind of situation we have here, except we're not really talking about like a solid object whacking into something. We're talking about an electromagnetic wave, but the principle is very similar. So in the little um, demo you may have seen, I think it's called a, what's the technical name? I have it here somewhere, a Crookes radiometer, radio, radiometer, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and um, yeah, in any case, so you have white, well, white, we see it as white because it's reflecting all the visible electromagnetic radiation that is hitting it. And so it is in this regime, okay? So its momentum, its change in energy, okay? It, or its change in momentum as a result of this transfer of energy is larger by a factor of two, whereas uh, on the black side, it's more or less a perfect absorber. The reason it looks black is because it's absorbing all of the light in the visible range where we can detect it, and this is that situation, right? Perfect absorption, a factor of a, uh, two less in terms of the resulting <coughs> change in momentum of that side, and so because the white side is uh, <clears throat> having a larger change in momentum, it starts moving in the direction indicated here, okay, which necessarily means that because they're connected to, you know, they're all the same object, just one side painted white, one side painted black, uh, you get rotation this way as well. Kind of a neat example of that. And there are larger scale ones, you know, radiation pressure. It's called radiation pressure, and you um, can harness it for solar sails and various other things. Okay, okay. Uh, I think if I'm remembering my time here, and of course I can move a little quicker when, I, um, when I'm not pausing for questions and things of that nature, so I think we've, we've covered a fair amount of material. I did want to look at one more thing, though. And this is mostly an aside, but I'd like you to understand it conceptually. And um, you are no doubt familiar with the idea of the Doppler effect. Yeah, here's where I would say, well, what's, what's, what do you understand the Doppler effect to be? Okay. And uh, for sound, I think this is... This is something everybody's familiar with, right? Uh, if you have someone laying on the car horn and they are <clears throat> approaching you, then the, the horn appears to have a higher pitch, but then once they've passed you and are moving away from you, then they go... And the, the pitch of the car horn or whatever sound it's making goes down when it transitions from approaching you to receding from you. And this has to do with you kind of sort of essentially sort of squishing the sound wave between the moving object and uh, you, the stationary observer, or maybe moving as well if you're like approaching it in another car or something. 
Well, the same kind of thing happens for light waves, okay? So electromagnetic waves. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw an ugly eyeball here. So we got, there it is, there's the pupil. Maybe put a little, little there we go. And uh, we're looking at something here. We're looking at a, a candle that's sitting over here. And we have a little flame there, and that's creating some light. And if everybody is stationary, so V equals zero, V equals zero, then the light created by the candle uh, appears to be, you know, some frequency, okay? Some average frequency. Now, if you do the same experiment, except that you are rapidly moving one or both of these objects so that they are approaching one another, okay? So the observer, maybe the, the source is also moving towards the observer, either or, okay? And we still have our candle. We'll assume that the movement doesn't actually blow out the, the flame. And what happens here is just like the approaching car with a sound wave, the wave gets kind of squished. And so I'm gonna exaggerate the effect here unless they're moving real fast, okay? But you get a much higher frequency uh, light being observed by the eyeball, okay? Your eyeball, perhaps. And so the candle's light, okay, its color, appear to be so-called uh, blue-shifted, okay? And then, of course, the got to get the receding case in there, right? So in the case of sound waves, you have this reduction in frequency when you oops, have a receding source or observer. And again, we got our candle here. And if we are moving away, either or both, okay, at significant speed, and I'll exaggerate the effect again here, you have what's called a redshift, okay? The frequency gets much smaller, and this is so-called redshifting. Redshift is used in astronomy, interestingly enough. Okay? As, as it turns out, everything is uh, moving away from us in the universe, and we can, <laughs> we can detect this um, based on the redshifting of the of the frequencies of light that we receive from all these distant astronomical objects. It's really kind of cool. It's used for all kinds of things and making assumptions about the nature of the universe and the things in it. Um, but as, as a little aside, a little conceptual aside, I thought the Doppler effect for light was uh, something that might be might be interesting to see. Okay, And you can see these kind of effects at a much smaller scale, and maybe we can talk briefly about that on Wednesday when we reconvene live, if all goes well. All right, so electromagnetic waves, some basic properties. We actually went a little beyond the scope of what uh, the technical bits of your chapter does, but I think that's fine. Electromagnetic waves are really important things, and understanding a little bit more of the quantitative stuff behind them, I think, is a good idea. When we come back on Wednesday, maybe we'll touch on the Doppler effect for light, a little bit more, nothing quantitative, all conceptual there. And then we're going to move on to talk about optics, lenses and refraction, reflection, diffraction, all of this kind of stuff, okay? So we have that to look forward to, and I'll see you then. Hope this recorded lecture worked out.